friends, you and I start today in a bit of a different place because the rear seats of a crossover baby buggy, specifically a two row, usually not a pleasant place to be. However, there's a couple of things that have jumped out here in this case. Uh, for example, uh, nowadays, most people feel that uh, engineers and car manufacturers should be publicly drawn and quartered if they don't have 85 USB ports in any one car. Well, Mazda has decided to follow suit, and there are two back here in the armrest, but it's not just two USB ports, uh, they're fast charging ports. So while you and I are talking, I'm charging my phone here. Then number two, heated seats are fitted in the rear. And then number three, let's say for the sake of discussion, you're hanging out with your like young hipster family friends and you're trying to bump some music in the front, but you got relegated to the back. Uh, you can recline the seat back here and try to look cool while you're doing it. Okay, so with that, let's talk engines. Before you and I unpack the engine output here, just want to point out we're back in one of my favorite places of San Diego, Shelter Island. We can see downtown San Diego there, but more importantly, a military base. So sometimes throughout this presentation, you will see a number of helicopters. Jim and I have seen not one, but two battleships. So it's been a very exciting afternoon. With that, let's talk engine output. And there really isn't a lot to discuss because there aren't a number of changes here. Uh, it's still the 2.54 cylinder that we saw when Mazda introduced Skyactiv, what, back in 2012. So the output here is very similar. It's 187, comes in at a very aggressive 6,000 RPM, and 184 pound-feet of torque comes in at also a very aggressive engine speed of 5,700. Now, there are a significant amount of changes going in there uh, to make the engine more efficient, but specifically to focus on NVH. Now, the theme here is to reduce NVH. And rather than me go on about it, uh, Dave Coleman and I shot a separate episode where he, man, he really nerds out about it. I mean, it just fell out of his pockets. So that episode will come up uh, later. So you make sure to check that out when he goes on about pistons and, and notches and pistons, and we'll discuss it then. So let's press on to driving dynamics. The theme here is a lot of small changes. Uh, you see, the CX-5 became Mazda's best seller by a long shot. So the logic was, don't screw with success. So a couple of things. Uh, 10 mils longer, 15 mils lower. The overall platform and the suspension are the same, with the exception of a different steering rack that's now fitted directly to the subframe rather than with the bushings. Uh, then the all-wheel drive system returns. Interesting little fun fact here, the all-wheel drive, the take rate on the previous model was ridiculously high. It was like 60%. So it returns here along with a six-speed automatic transmission. Now there is a G vectoring control which was fitted to the 6, the 3, and the CX-9 last year. That's now fitted as standard here. Once again, if we have access to Dave Coleman, why don't we let him explain it? So he's going to come on and talk about the G vectoring control in a separate episode when he talks about the pistons and all that kind of stuff. Now, let's you and I unpack the interior. Inside, there is a hell of a lot more going on. Let's start with design. So it is very clear that the design of the interior here has been influenced by the CX-9. Now, there's a very specific trick that the designers have used, and that is horizontal lines on the dash to accentuate width of the overall car. They've done something similar with the grille to make the vehicle look a lot wider than it actually is, and they've repeated that here inside. Then there's the color and trim. Like specifically, you look at the seats. Now, this one with the white here and the black on the top of the dash, love the look when it's new. Something tells me this won't look great in a couple of years after a couple of drives with jeans like this. But look at this, you've got this double stitch, and this is something you would see in like a British car. And here it's an actual real stitch, but here it's a faux stitch here and a faux stitch here. Not excited about this. Then look at this. This is not wood, it's not trying to be wood. This is real metal. But the logic is make it look like there's some grain, so they've taken the idea of wood and patterned it into the metal. Very nice touch here. You've got to see this in person to really understand it. Now let's press on to some technology pieces. Uh, first and foremost, they changed the steering wheel. In the presentation, they made a huge stink about the shape of the steering wheel, and it's more pleasing to thumbs. Go figure. 
Uh, then the infotainment system. So there are three zones of it. So there's the screen here, there's a TFT screen here, but most importantly, there's a head-up display. Now, if you've seen a Mazda 3, it tilts up. It's not really a full head-up display. Here, it shoots into the windscreen, but what's interesting, it's height adjustable, and for the first time that I've ever seen, it's tied into the memory seat. Very cool touch. Then let's come back to this. It is a 4.6 inch diagonal screen, not the biggest one out there. And the obvious thing is, does it have Apple CarPlay or Android Auto? And currently, the answer is no. Now, I spent a lot of time talking to the engineers about this. And if I'm reading between the lines here, my thinking is uh, that they're still trying to sort out their own processor requirements here, as well as their own UX before they take somebody else's UX like Apple or Google and put it on top of their system. But one interesting thing that came out of that discussion, they did say that they're going to support Apple CarPlay and they said hopefully it's going to be this year, uh, but they're trying to make it retroactive to cars with, with a Mazda Connect system. So that goes back to like 2013, but there's a catch. Unlike Hyundai where you just take a USB stick, put it in the car and it updates the car to like Android Auto, here, in some cases, meaning the older cases, you'd have to change the entire hardware, but it can be done. Okay, let's go back outside to San Diego. Okay, so perfect timing. I didn't promise you a battleship, but I got some sort of military ship over there. I think it's like a transport ship. It's gray, it's definitely military, it's going to the base, and it's incredibly cool. Okay, let's go back to like baby buggies. So there's one thing I didn't tell you about. You know how when we drove the 2013 S-Class when it was changed, and we made a huge deal about those stereo cameras in the windshield? Well, ever since then, that technology has cascaded down to like normal people's cars. Well, now this is the first one where the camera is being reduced in size. And yeah, okay, technology goes forward. But I gotta be honest, I don't like the smaller camera. I like this big honking camera in my windshield because it tells me something's going on there. Maybe that's just me. So. Uh, we are going to drive this in the full first drive review. I'm going to come back to you with an episode with just Dave Coleman after that. But in the interim, I want to leave you with a question. If you're reading the tea leaves here correctly, this is evolutionary changes, not revolutionary changes, much like those Kias that we've driven over the past couple of months. So my question to you is this. Do you like the evolutionary changes, especially considering that this was their best-selling model, or would you rather see revolutionary changes? And this is more just about design. Let me know why or why not in the comments below or via our social media, Moto Man TV All One Word, Moto Man TV All One Word, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And with that, I want to leave you with two things. Number one, make sure you download our fancy new mobile application, which you can download for free, which has been updated uh, from Apple, iTunes, or Google Play. And number two, a fun fact. So Mazda got started in 1920, but it wasn't started as Mazda. It was incorporated as Toyo Cork Kogu Co Limited, and their business wasn't cars, it was three wheeled trucks. But when they did finally introduce cars, they called that line Mazdas. Until I see you next time, bish beta.